These are some of the most powerful and terrifying animals in the history of our planet. Those pressure sensors are so sensitive that they can detect the smallest disturbance. This awesome gentleman, Mamadou, made a video on how crocodiles have pressure sensors. I commented on the video and explained how Spinosaurus has the same pressure sensors. To which his response was this. Let me explain to you why he's especially right. Both groups of animals have a bone called a foramina that's connected to their pressure sensors, which causes all the little holes you see in both skulls. Through that, they're connected to nerves. A scientist described crocodilians' pressure sensors as being sensitive enough to detect a human hair falling in the water. Because Spinosaurus had its own pressure sensors, we know it had some degree of sensitivity, though we're not entirely sure to what extent. It's also been shown that crocodilians have had this trait for millions of years, even before Spinosaurus, which is an example of convergent evolution. As Mamadou explained, crocodilians' pressure sensors are enough for them to detect prey even when they can't see. Considering some modern crocodilians swim like this, it's assumed that Spinosaurids possibly did the same to conceal a majority of their body, including that big spine. Nature at its finest, y'all. This animal's a member of the forest racidae, more commonly known as terror birds. They come in a wide variety, to say the least. Some species like Cal and Ken could reach over 8 feet tall, with the smallest species reaching about 3 feet. The terror birds are a group of birds that used to dominate South America. As part of their deadly arsenal, most of them came equipped with a hooked beak. Some scientists suggest that they could have been specialized to hunt small prey. That's due to their beak's apparent weakness. However, some scientists have also pointed out that some animals don't have the strongest bite force, yet they were still taking on enormous animals in their environment. So some folks think that they could have specialized in hunting large prey instead. Once thought that direct competition with big cats and other large predators is what drove them to extinction. Smilodon, along with other American carnivores, moved south into South America through the Isthmus of Panama, while some of the forest racidae like Titanus moved north. That event was known as the Great American Interchange, and it placed the terror birds in direct competition with animals like big cats. But the jury's still out to whether that's what caused their extinction or not. We will need further evidence to know for sure. A fearsome relative of Tyrannosaurus rex. This is Displetosaurus, and they're a force to be reckoned with. They can reach lengths of up to 30 feet, possess the longest arms relative to body side of any late Tyrannosaur. And as we all know, T-Rex is famous for its teeth. Those teeth had begun to evolve in more basal Tyrannosaurs like Displetosaurus, which means these guys had a much more robust and powerful jaw. These powerful jaws would allow them to tackle even Ceratopsians. But that wouldn't be their only problem. Evidence shows they coexisted with another Tyrannosaur, Gorgosaurus. They may have niche partitioned in order to avoid confrontations like this more often. It's currently assumed the main prey of Displetosaurus was Ceratopsian, which would make their main competition each other. It's been shown that Displetosaurus was a face biter, likely due to competition for mates and resources. And if they can do all that to another Displetosaurus, imagine what they do to us humans. Everybody talks about the raptors from Jurassic Park. What about its bigger real-life relative? This animal is called Utah Raptor. At over 6 feet tall and 20 feet long, it's the biggest of the Dromaeosaurid raptors. With Utah Raptor, that's just the beginning. I'm sure we've all heard Dr. Grant talk about Velociraptor claws. Utah Raptor's claws are upwards of 8 inches in length. They also possess a thicker tibia when compared to other Dromaeosaurids. And even compared to other Dromaeosaurids, it was heavy for its body size. They're currently believed to be about the same weight as a grizzly bear. But being heavier means they had a low center of gravity. Studies have shown that the claws on their hands were also longer and more specialized for cutting. But where does all that leave us? Well, it's currently assumed that they use those large claws on their feet to hook into their prey, which would free their hands and jaws up to deal some serious damage. Major negative to all that way was that they weren't as fast as other raptors, which meant that they were likely ambush hunters, which means most of its prey probably never saw it coming. These guys are terrifying, awe-inspiring, and downright brilliant predators. I mean, look at that. Would you want to be that dinosaur right now? This is the flesh crocodile, more commonly known as Sarcosuchus. Their name's a little misleading. You see, they're part of a group known as crocodiliforms, which are related to crocodiles but are not true crocodilians. These guys are up to 30 feet in length. They lived in what is currently Africa and South America, and they ate dinosaurs. In South America, might have included dinosaurs like Mapusaurus. In Africa, they had to contend with dinosaurs like Suchomimus, and that bulbous tip on their nose may have helped them stay underwater for longer periods. This part of its snout is called a bulla. It puts even Squidward's nose to shame. It's been compared to the modern Gariales Gara. Unlike Gariales, all Sarcosuchus had a bulla, which would give them an edge in ambush hunting. They were once thought to be the largest species of crocodiliforms. Just like all crocodilians, they're an animal to be respected. Unless you want an up-close and personal tooth count. This animal was dubbed the crocodile mimic for obvious reasons. This is Suchomimus tenorensis, and it's a very popular spinosaurid. We're originally discovered in 1997, but were named and described in 1998 by Paul Sereno and his team. They were fairly large predators. They could reach up to 36 feet in length. It's assumed that the holotype was a subadult, meaning that they could get even larger. Like many spinosaurids, they possess straightened conical teeth. 
In the top jaw, there's a kink that leads to what's called a terminal rosette. It's assumed they use these longer teeth at the front of their jaws as their main tool for capturing prey. While it had plenty of options for prey, there was definitely competition around. Their main competition likely came from a giant crocodilomorph known as Sarcosuchus, which was large enough to hunt Suchomimus on occasion. There's another difference between these guys and their more famous cousins. Suchomimus was likely capable of swimming like Spinosaurids, but their bones were much more hollow than Baryonyx or Spinosaurus, meaning it just kind of waded in the water instead of diving. That really just goes to show the variety in Spinosaur evolution. Brilliant. Knowing animals like this existed at one point make me understand why people were afraid of the ocean. This animal is known as Dunkleosteus. These Nightmare Nemos come in a 10-pack, with the largest one reaching up to 29 feet in length. They lived over 300 million years ago during the Devonian, where they ruled over the seas. And with the Devonian looking like this, that meant they ruled over a lot. They were the largest of a group known as Placoderms. And while they don't have teeth in a traditional sense, that armor forms into some sort of beak that can bite down about 1500 PSI. And more recent studies showed us that they look similar to sharks. Minus, you know, the vampire dentures. Biomechanical studies show that their jaws could open within 60 milliseconds, which means they probably ate like groupers using a sort of suction feeding, following it up with one of those powerful bites. Which means for this guy, there is no happy ever after. At least Dunkleosteus isn't around today, but it really makes you wonder what else the ocean is hiding from us. And if you want to learn more about prehistoric animals, be sure to check out my page. I'm convinced y'all just like getting scared. A bunch of you have asked me about this monstrosity, the Caprosuchus. They're not actually monstrosities, they're just very powerful predators, which is why many people see them that way. Caprosuchus saharicus means boar croc, which it was named for because of these teeth. They have three sets of what are called caniniform teeth. These teeth are relatively straight and sharp-edged. Their small teeth were also small and blade-like. This differs drastically from modern crocodilians who have conical teeth. Based on its skull and a related animal, we can guesstimate about how long and what it looked like. Which brings us to the scary part, because these guys are terrestrial. They still have been semi-aquatic, but they were mainly land-based predators. If regular crocodiles weren't dangerous enough for you, how about the one that's gonna chase you all the way up the block? They're not evil, but those horns aren't helping either. Those horns are actually unique to Caprosuchus and formed from the squamosal and parietal bones. And if all that wasn't bad enough, it also had semi-stereoscopic vision, meaning it had depth perception. It's big enough to get you, fast enough to chase you, good enough eyesight to keep track of you. They're a magnificent animal, but you gotta be happy they're extinct. Dinosaurs and bison, they don't share anything in common, right? Wrong. At least that's what's assumed. This predator is known as Acrocanthosaurus. At up to 38 feet in length, it's one of the largest predatory dinosaurs. And its name means high-spined lizard. But what does this have to do with bison? Bison have high spines too. These spines allow for muscle attachments that reinforce the neck. Based on their skeletal reconstructions, Acrocanthosaurus may have had this hump as well which would make its bite a lot stronger. Those powerful neck muscles would have given them good leverage and allowed their short arms to get in and deal some damage as well. Such hunting tactics would allow them to take on larger prey than usual. However, some scientists do argue against this theory. Most of them suggest that the spines were instead used for display purposes such as mating. We'll need more data to confirm either. But regardless, we know that they were the top predator in their ecosystem, because their only competition was Deinonychus. And if the theory about the neck muscles are true, it's one of the most powerful predators to ever exist. Absolutely amazing. If you want to learn more about prehistoric animals, please check out my page. This is the largest flying creature that ever existed. Its name is Quetzalcoatlus. I don't think some people realize just how big they get. I don't even think I have to say anything. At over 10 feet tall with a 30 foot wingspan, it makes even LeBron James look like a midget. These guys are one of the Asdarkid pterosaurs. The name Asdarkid actually comes from the Persian word Asdar, which was a dragon-like creature. I think it's pretty obvious why they get compared to dragons. So let's talk about how terrifying these guys actually are. While it's been shown that they can fly, it's assumed that they hunt it on the ground. You see, their body plan includes an incredibly long neck. With the way their body is positioned, it's assumed they hunted similar to modern-day storks. Their extended height gives them extended range, which would make it incredibly easy for them to snatch up small prey. Their limb proportions have also been compared to modern-day ungulates, which means it may have been able to run similar to animals like giraffes. Imagine a stork so big that it could look at you through your second-story window, has a long enough neck to reach you inside, and fast enough to run you down. That's Quetzalcoatlus.